Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Bell, Professor Emeritus, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, Department of Surgery, University of Toronto. Hi, I'm Will Falk. I'm a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. In June of 2020, just five months after the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in Canada, 70% of ambulatory care in the country moved to virtual care. For patients not having to make a face-to-face -face appointment cut costs, including those to lost income from time off work, the cost of childcare, and the cost of getting to the doctor's office or hospital. At the C.D. Howe Institute, the question became, is this a model to reduce costs and increase efficiency for the healthcare provider too? The Institute's report at the time was titled, Canada's Virtual Care Revolution, a Framework for Success. And Will is one of the report's authors, and he wrote a follow-up in 2022 that included commentary from Dr. Bell. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Will, you also had a large team working on this report. These were frontline people? Yeah, we had a group uh, centered at Women's College in the Center for Digital Health Evaluation, a mix of uh, providers, um, frontline providers uh, from uh, Women's College, St. Mike's, and uh, a number of other institutions. And Bob, while you weren't a frontline worker at the, the height of, of COVID, uh, you provided us some insight as well into the progress that was made during that time. Yeah, that's right, Michael. I mean, as a deputy minister in the province of Ontario, I'd spent time negotiating with physicians around virtual care prior to the pandemic. And certainly we discovered during the pandemic that simply providing the ability for physicians to be paid for providing virtual care was a tremendous impetus for the change that occurred with the way the primary care was, uh, was provided to Ontarians and Canadians and other provinces. Now, Will, your report proposes that care redesign starts with asking three simple questions. Is this medical service necessary? Can this medical service be delivered well without physical contact? And what site of service is best for physical contact? How would we determine who asks those questions and how we arrive at the answers? Yeah, it's it's a great question and, and one that um, we've been doing multiple iterations of over the last few years. You know, when we started at the beginning of COVID, because things moved so quickly, Michael, we, we had a real de-anchoring effect. And, and what happens when you de-anchor a system, a complex system like our, like our health system, is that new answers become apparent and new questions come up. And um, one of the work of uh, one of my co-authors um, wa was uh, quite important in this regard, where they uh, tracked different specialties and how different specialties reacted during the different waves of the pandemic. And it was fascinating to see because as infection control became more or less important, you had specialties who would change how they practiced. Now, some of those changes ended up being permanent. There were, there were cases where, not that anyone was doing anything wrong, but we were stuck in the past and we became unstuck. But on the other hand, there were cases where it was pretty clear that moving to virtual wasn't as good as physical, and so we moved back again. And that kind of iteration has, has continued on a specialty by specialty basis. And there's, frankly, there's a lot more work to be done. You know, Michael, I can just fill in here a bit. Uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, for example, that's where my background training is, where I uh, served as a surgeon in Ontario. Um, you know, if somebody comes to you with an injured knee after having a tennis accident, something like that, you really want to examine their knee. You want to wiggle it back and forth. You want to see if the knee's stable or is there potential ligament damage. That's obviously not a service that can be provided well virtually. On the other hand, if you have a mole that looks like it could be a, you know, a potential problematic malignancy perhaps, taking a picture of that and sending it to a dermatologist can certainly provide uh, some evidence of whether or not you should be concerned. Where do you feel we are right now as far as the interest in maintaining this kind of hybridized approach to, to health care? Because I've had personal experience where I've been told, no, no, you, you got to go into the doctor's office uh, I, again for something that 
quite frankly, could have been solved with a photograph. Yeah, it, it kind of um, it kind of sucks to live in a transition age in some ways, you know. And and I, I think we've all had that experience in in other new technologies coming in. What's odd about this one is that it's sometimes not particularly new technology that we're using, right? I mean, we're we're using the phone and email, which most of us have been using in many parts of our life for a long time. But we got, I, I made reference to the idea of de-anchoring, we got pulled away from what was normal. And so now we're having to work through, uh, we talked in our, our, our CD Howe report and then later about having to work through from two baselines. So we have that pre-pandemic 1819 baseline and then we have this mid-pandemic baseline. And so you're seeing a lot of thinking about where there were good elements, where there were bad elements. Again, I don't mean to give you a waffly answer when I say this, Michael, but I think that this back and forth is going to happen for a while. I'm, you know, I'm, I come at it more from a technology point of view, so I'm quite excited by it because what it does mean is that you've got competing models of production right, to take it away from medicine for a moment. You've got competing models of production and competing ways that people can look at it, which, you know, frankly, is not something we've always done a lot of in our healthcare system. We, we usually talk in terms of one best practice. And at, in many cases, we now have multiple competing practices, um, and it will take us our, I'm going to guess, I'm going to say right now, we're probably at a quarter to a third virtual, down from that 70% you talked about. I don't know, Bob, if you'd agree with that or not, but something around that. Some yeah. practices are still at 50, 60, and again, it varies by specialty. So you're gonna see this in and out as we go forward. Michael, you asked a couple of minutes ago, if I may, um, you know, how, who decides? How do you decide what service is appropriate? And I think this needs to be a considered discussion between the patient and the provider in many ways. Yeah. Uh, there are obviously patient features you mentioned earlier about convenience, about cost, taking time off work, paying high parking prices in some downtown hospitals, for example. So there are certain patient convenience features that need to be considered here. And then of course, there are the professional elements. The uh, physician needs to tell the patient, look, this is not an appropriate visit for a virtual visit. I need to do something face-to-face -face that I can't do over the phone or on telemedicine lines, video conferencing. So I think this is a considered decision to be made as part of the collaboration that occurs between patients and their providers. I think uh, there's a really interesting little calculator that our friends over at Canada Health Infoway put out that's just fascinating. They calculate, they've got a calculator online where you can figure out in your own personal situation, what the buried cost of a visit is for you. And they're asserting at this point, the median cost um, out of pocket or lost income for a visit for the average Canadian is about $99. So they're saying that it's about a hundred bucks for um, a patient, this is COVID aside, so this is not in the high infection control world. But it's about a hundred bucks for most people, and of course, what's really interesting about that, uh, uh, beyond just the hundred dollars, is that it falls disproportionately on hourly workers and people with children or uh, who are caregivers themselves in their home, because if you're an hourly worker, you have the lost revenue, whereas whereas uh, w for people in salaried positions. You don't have that same effect and the same immediate impact. So there's a buried equity issue that, you know, we've really not talked about a lot in our public systems about barriers to care for people who who find physical visits very expensive. I don't mean to sound too evangelical about this. The truth is, is that there are lots of visits that are going to have to continue to be physical. But it is interesting to think about how much that buried cost is even in a free public system. I want to get your take on competition. Uh, as you sort of implied a little bit earlier, and it sort of suggests to me, it's almost the third rail of healthcare uh, to, to have this sort of conversation. But before we move on to that, 
let's sort of wrap up this aspect of that remote care versus in-person care with something that you've written about, Will, in the past, which is um, this shift as a disruptive innovation. How do we prevent inertia from getting in the way of disruptive innovation and just sliding back to that, you know, 2018, 2019 baseline? Well, I, at, at, at some level, we don't. At, at some level, um, inertia, conservatism um, is is not even a bad thing. Uh, I mean, um, we we need to we need to be thoughtful about how we move from things. I, I mean, I I'm enthusiastic uh, in the way I talk about de-anchoring, but I'm also mindful that there's there's real there's real potential for harm. I I will say though that I think that most providers in most situations now recognize that their range of option is way expanded. And, you know, people, people never really wanted to bring people in to their offices to, to renew prescriptions for maintenance medications, but they were doing it routinely because we had regulations and fee schedules. So, so I don't think it's inertia at the provider level that's a problem. I, I do think that the regulatory colleges have been very slow during the COVID pandemic and that, that that's been problematic. Bob, this sounds like a very diplomatic response. Well, I think the other thing that Will mentioned, but perhaps I can expand on, is the role of discussions between the profession and the ministry over funding, right? There's no question the thing that opened up virtual care across Canada was providing a fee code. And there have been lots of discussions about appropriateness of uh, of virtual care prior to that. But in the absence of appropriate fee codes, people simply had to come in for renewal of their prescriptions, even though it's pretty straightforward to do that over the phone. So I think it's important to remember that healthcare does respond. The healthcare practice responds to financial incentives. No surprise there. Physicians are people who respond to various incentives. And for governance and medical associations to consider the impact on patients, as Will just said, $100 to drop in to have your prescription renewed is not a reasonable cost. And to remember when these negotiations are going on at the labor management table between ministries and medical associations, that there are impacts that are real and sometimes financial impacts on people receiving care. In the Global Mail, the Institute's Rosalie Wanch wrote that the recent controversy sparked by Ontario's announcement that it'll expand the use of private surgery and diagnostic imaging clinics misses the point. What do you gentlemen see as the point? Well, I actually refuse to engage in the discussion on uh, private surgeries just because I think it's a side issue. Uh, <laughs> and the least important of the three recent Ford announcements, um, I think it's entirely predictable that uh, that um, that a conservative government will open up IHF surgeries, um, and I think it's um, uh, a relatively minor issue about how we need to manage quality. I thought his other two announcements, the pharmacist scope of practice and the unilateral disarmament on licensing, were far more important and way more interesting. And it's you know, it's fascinating to me that people portray Mr. Ford, I and mean, we're getting into politics here, portray Mr. Ford as if he's some kind of a bumpkin, and he just made two really sophisticated moves. Um, I, I, like on the IHF one, I really won't be drawn out about it. I've been, ambi I've been agnostic on it for, for decades and continue to maintain that position. I can argue and have argued for clients on both sides of it. Um, it doesn't surprise me that a conservative government would do it. So I've been kind of outspoken on this issue, perhaps, Michael. You know, as a, an orthopedic surgeon, there are two types of surgery that fit very well into community surgery centers, ophthalmology and orthopedic surgery, both high-volume types of surgery that people want. Cataract surgery, total joint replacements, these are surgeries that you know, people want as restoration of lifestyles, getting rid of pain, getting rid of blurred vision, and certainly surgeries which have developed backlogs during the pandemic. And my view is that we need to move many surgeries out of main hospital operating rooms into community surgery centers 
simply because it's well known and understood that if you do that, you can accomplish about 30% more care, 30% more surgeries in an eight hour day or a 10 hour day because you purpose build these centers to actually increase throughput of patients through the anesthesia surgery circuit, so to speak, and you can do more work. Now, my view is strongly that these should be governed by, organized by, and administered by publicly funded entities, be they hospitals or not-for-profit community organizations. And why do I say that? Because in my view, for-profit facilities always cost the taxpayer more. And the recent announcements agree with Will that two of the three announcements by the Premier were sophisticated and highly appropriate. The third, providing, you know, for-profit cataract centers with public funding for doing cataract surgery in uh, private centers, I think missed the mark because they actually pay these for-profit cataract providers about 100 bucks a case more than they pay hospitals and community clinics for doing it. So as is usual, when we bring private sector for-profit organizations into public care, they end up charging more because let's face it, they have to pay the staff the same. They have to pay the implant providers pretty much the same. If you're buying cataract lenses on a provincial basis as hospitals do, you're not gonna get a worse deal than small for-profit centers are. So most of the costs are the same. And in order to achieve a profit, then these centers need to charge the taxpayer more, as is the case with the, with the Premier's recent announcements. I, I agree with about 80% of what Bob just said. Um, and Bob and I share a uh, career mentor, um, uh, Alan Hudson, who uh, Dr. Hudson um, opened up the Kensington for cataracts. And um, I wrote a paper about cataracts um, back in that same time period, and I actually tracked cataract prices from the invention of the cataract surgery, which was 1947, um, through till today. And it's fascinating when you, when you look at cataract prices, cataract costs, cataract costs decline by 6% per annum and have consistently since 1947. So the price of a, a cataract surgery, uh, which used to involve six days of immobilization and about six hours of OR time per eye, um, was roughly the, the same as the cost of, a, of an automobile when the surgery was first invented in 1947. But because of consistent technology advances, the, the costs have dropped every year by 6%. What's really interesting about that is that's very similar to what you see in computers over the same period. And by the way, um, the computer transistor, interestingly, was, in, it was um, introduced in the same year, 1947. And about 17 years later, Gordon Moore uh, talked about Moore's Law, in which he said that the price of technology declines by about 50% every every two years. Now, why am I going into this much detail? We in the public system do not bring prices down routinely. We think that prices should go up and that there's inflation in medicine, which is not true in the case of the cataracts. And so one of the things that the public system misses often, and it can be corrected within the public system, and I've worked actually with Bob um, in the past on trying to, to do this, uh, and with Dr. Hudson uh, more particularly, is you can bring private sector methods in to keep the prices declining. And it's an example of a non-functioning price mechanism, which is really my point. And so while I agree that there are problems in moving it to the private system, I would always point out that the failure of the public system and its price mechanism is so profound that having some way to check prices is necessary to ensure that a system functions. And we have lost that since the wait times initiative. And in fact, I don't think 455 is a fair price anymore, Bob. 
I think it well, should be lower. So the disagreement I have with what Will's saying is that the only thing more ineffective than the price lowering mechanism evident in the public system is the way that RFPs are typically provided to for profit institutions that want to provide service. And this is a classic example. The government set the price. The government set the price at $605 and said, who wants to do cataracts at $605? Send us a, you know, a response to this request for proposals when the government pays hospitals somewhere between, as well said, 450 that's probably a little low, to $500. And that is an all-in price. The various apologists for the hospital are saying, oh, no, that's not the true price. The hospital has all this other budget that contributes to it. It's not true. The way this price was set was to look at all the direct and indirect costs associated with doing cataract surgery back in 2010 to 2013. That included hospital maintenance. It included the CEO salary. It included costs for teaching and research. All those costs were carved out, and the government then said, here, you can do cataract surgery. We'll give you cases based on your ability to do them, not at the high cost, not at the median cost, but at the 40% cost. So we've looked at all the hospitals in Ontario that do case costing. We've looked at a variety of prices, and if you want to do cataracts, you can do them at 40%. I agree with Will that was not the most sophisticated way to look at price competition, but it was a lot better than saying, we'll give you a 605, do you want to do so? And, and so then look, how do we avoid the thin edge to the wedge of privatization of healthcare in the process? Well, relocating uh, away from the hospital to allow the health system to increase overall volume. Yeah, well, the well, first well, thing sorry, I'd let's say be, is- Let's be clear you know, how many, okay. So I'm speaking now well. Uh, the first thing I say is, look, I believe in publicly funded health care. But if private sector players can provide the same quality at a better cost by bringing some sort of ingenuity to the system, bring it on. As a guy who's you know, managed operating rooms, managed hospitals, I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen because the experience, be it in Saskatchewan, be it in Alberta, be it in B.C., now, with cataracts in Ontario, the truism is being followed that private for-profit care always costs the taxpayer more. But I'd say have a competitive RFP. The thing that troubled me about the cataract announcement was they only allowed people in independent health facilities to respond. They didn't allow the Ivy Center in London, which gets 500 bucks a case for some one of the world's best cataract centers. They didn't allow Trillium Health Partners with some of the best cataract surgeons in the world, to respond to it. They only looked at independent health facilities. I think that was a big mistake. So, so, so again, I totally, I, 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 I'm 85, 90% in agreement with Bob. For me, what's happened here is that during COVID, we've lost our price mechanism. There is no price mechanism anymore, broadly speaking, in healthcare. HBAM has been largely abandoned. The QBP stuff has been undermined, and we need a thoughtful reintroduction of a price mechanism. What Bob described would be a thoughtful reintroduction. I would only add one other thing, and I've said this on the record many times, which is there also needs to be spot pricing or surge pricing. So when you run an auction process, when you run an auction process, this is like this happens in treasury bonds a lot. You want to have a, a total price that includes fixed costs. But you also want, if you can, to get marginal cost information. And the way you get marginal cost information is by reserving 10 or 20 percent of your volumes and putting them out to tender on a spot tender market, a buy it now market, and seeing if you get takers. Now, my guess is, and this is a guess having watched cataract prices now for 20 years, my guess is the spot price for cataracts is about 250 bucks. But no one's going to tell you that in a tender process because they're going to build their fixed costs in. So, you know, take, take, take all the cataracts in the province, allocate 80% of the volumes, 
at the start of the year. Take the remaining 20%, put 15% out of the quarterly tenders, which will get you a lower price, and then take the last 5% and don't tell them where you're going to put it out. And when your wait list gets a little high, put it out as a spot tender and see what you get. My guess is you're in the high 200s. And that way you also get the information for next year about what the actual costs are. Because, you know, I mean... I, again, I'll come back to the Moore's Law point, okay? Every 12-year-old knows that computers are cheaper after Christmas and next year, right? Computers go down in price. Well, so do cataracts. And, I mean, there are places in the world where they do cataracts for 20 bucks. And do them well, by the oh. way, Bob, with good outcomes, as you know. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily take doctors to do them. However, we're not going to go into that line of thinking here. Okay. What, what, I, what I would say, and yeah. should we continue this topic, Michael, or do you want to change the topic? We could talk for hours on this topic of... Well, yeah, that, really that is a bit of a concern, one, is, is that this is going to turn into the Joe Rogan podcast of medicine yeah. for yeah. three Absolutely. straight hours. Well, uh, you know what I would like to do, though, is, is to, to wrap up our time together by uh, pointing out that we've got the C.D. Howe Regent debate scheduled for later this month. I would like to get from each of you, and, and uh, Will, we'll start with you, uh, you know, age before beauty, uh, what the key issues should we be debating that are not being discussed? What are your thoughts? Look, 60% um, of healthcare is being delivered by by private organizations at this point. If you take a social determinants of health point of view, if you take a wellness and a whole life point of view, there are obviously huge parts of the expenditure that are going to come out of private funds along with public funds. We need to engage in an adult discussion, not play gotcha politics where we embarrass uh, politicians. You know, I look, I'm a liberal. I've been a liberal all my life. I stopped working in war rooms and liberal campaigns because in the last two weeks of every goddamn election, you'd have people uh, accusing the other side of privatizing health care because there were votes in it. It's not an adult way to have a discussion about privatization. We, we need something nuanced. And, you know, we, we probably need a rewrite of the Canada Health Act. Uh, to reflect it, particularly in the areas of aging and mental health. Bob, so, final thoughts as you. I understand it, the region debate is about competition. And I think competition is good. It provides the ability for consumers, patients in this case, to choose their provider based on quality. And it allows funders to choose who's going to be funded to do procedures or provide services based on cost. I think the problem we have right now is we have an excess of demand and insufficient supply, which makes it difficult to run competition in a way that's going to be meaningful from price point setting. The thing that worries me is artificial competition when we say it's innovative to introduce for-profit players. As Will says, there are lots of for-profit players in the healthcare delivery market already, including every fam well, most family doctors who are small business providers. However, if we're going to introduce competition by unfairly benefiting for-profit providers with an increased revenue line, that to me is bound to fail and will frustrate tra taxpayers as much as it does patients. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and insight. And a minimum amount of blood spilled in this conversation. Thank you again. There's a bit of bile on the floor, Michael, I think, isn't there? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Robert Bell is a professor emeritus at the Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. And William Falk is a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute and an executive fellow at the Rockman School of Management, also at the University of Toronto. For more on this topic, join us February 23rd for the C.D. Howe Regent debate titled Be It Resolved, Competition Will Save Canada's Broken Health Care System. Speaking for the motion is Christy Clark, former Premier of British Columbia, alongside Sean Francis, the chair and CEO of MedCan. Speaking against the motion is former federal leader of the opposition, Thomas Mulcair, and Dr. Danielle Martin, professor and chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto.
Go to cdhow.org to learn more. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.